Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar and podcast series featuring talks from the Middle East Forums projects. My name is Dexter Van Zyl and I'm editor of Focus on Western Islamism and I will be moderating this discussion today. Today our guest is uh, Susanna Johnston who attended the Islamic Society of North America's annual convention that took place outside of Chicago over Labor Day this weekend. Susanna is an intrepid investigative reporter, and she has written a number of articles for FYI about her findings at the conference. And before we begin, I would like to remind our listeners that they can submit questions at the bottom of the screen by posting them in the Q&A section. Uh, so let's begin. Susanna, what was it like at the conference? Give us a description of the attendees and uh, vendors at the event and the overall vibe. Can you tell us about the vibe? Sure. Uh, uh, first, thanks for having me. Um, I got there, you know, early Friday afternoon. So they were still setting up when I arrived. Uh, the vendors were still setting up. Most people hadn't arrived yet. Um, but overall, uh, I would say, I mean, people by Friday night, things were pretty full and it was really friendly people, young people, a lot of young families. I'd say probably half of the attendees were um, under, under 40 at least, maybe under 30. Uh, Lots of strollers, small children, um, sweet people, though. And obviously enough, I mean, people were very kind here, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Uh, and uh, very real. Well, I mean, somewhat to be expected. The vendors were very uh, were very engaging, but really, I mean, everyone everyone was friendly. I didn't encounter anyone that was not. Okay. So what was attendance like? I think that was a concern and that was an issue that people spoke about. Yeah. Um, so pri prior to the convention, they were some press saying that uh, they uh, leadership, ISTA leadership came out and said, hey, we're expecting, you know, 50,000 attendees. They definitely did not have 50,000 attendees. I don't know what attendance exactly was. It's pretty hard to estimate attendance. Um, but I would say a few thousand is a, it was, seems a lot more like it. And if you uh, look at their uh, ISNA has not put out anything since the convention to say, uh, hey, we had a fantastic attendance. They've said they had thousands, um, but I put it in the low thousands. Uh, and this was this was a point that was actually brought up at their General Assembly. Uh, one of their sessions at the convention was their General Assembly, and they had a few things that they voted on. Um, but about 50 people attended that General Assembly, and a number of those people had a lot of complaints about uh, what's going on with membership with ISNA, and why is it uh, why is this organization dwindling? Uh, and attendance here is terrible. And how are we how are we going to get to the the next generation? How are we not not going to lose them? Now, one of the things that uh, that popped into my head right now is is that that still didn't stop the fact that there wasn't an awful lot of attendance uh, or attendees didn't stop. Uh, people from the Biden administration and other public officials to show show up at this event. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And what do you think is going on? Sure. Well, historically, uh, ISNA has been a really one of the leading Islamist organizations in the U.S. They've had they have had huge attendance in the past, and so I think I mean they they still have that name. Uh, and so I, the presidential administrations, Clinton, uh, at, at least as far back as Clinton, uh, have have shown some involvement with ISNA and ISNA leadership. And so I think there's probably some holdover from that. Okay. Now, do you now what do you think? What talk to us about their political messaging? What do you think is going going on? What is their message, and and how did that jibe with some of the uh, lifestyle messaging that they offered at the event? Sure. Uh, I think it was a, a bit incongruous. Uh, so first off, let me talk about a little bit about the the social, so-called social issues messaging. Uh, they were very vague on that. Uh, they seem to be presenting, you know, both progressive and Islamist positions vaguely at the same time. So that if you were attending, it was like, well, what, what am I supposed to think about that? So an example of that was that the abortion issue came up, um, LGBTQ issues came up. And on both of those issues, the speakers panelists who were being asked these questions hardly ever had anything to say. I mean, it was like, oh, what? so one speaker when asked said, oh, well, we need, we need to be investing in schools and scholarships so that people have answers for these tough questions. 
And uh, I would think that if you're an attending, you just be like, well, okay, so what am I supposed to think about this issue? Am I supposed to be for or against? Or And it was just, it was very vague. Now, contrasting with that, to a certain extent, they were a lot bolder with their political, uh, their political perhaps enthusiasm. Uh, you had several uh, elected officials who spoke, um, as you mentioned, a couple of people from the Homeland Security Administration, Representative, uh, U.S. House Representative Andre Carson was there, uh, Indiana State Senator Fadi Quadora was there, and then you had a handful of other people too. And, um, and I believe uh, the governor also, um, the governor of Illinois uh, did a, a Zoom or something for them. I, I was not present for that, but it's an additional social media on that. But they they didn't have much that they were celebrating. That was a very curious thing. They, you know, so they were, it was, it was a lot of kind of a lot of hot air. And really what they were saying is, hey, uh, Muslims are a minority in the US and look at us, we've made it to the highest places in the land. Isn't that great? Let's keep that up. But they didn't have anything more substantive that they were saying. Now, there was some unhappiness at the event about there was a, a booth from the Customs and Border Patrol at the event. Uh, and did you talk to us about that? Sure. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol was there. Uh, they had a booth. I didn't see. I mean, there were there were a lot of booths, so it was hard. And there were people milling around in there, so hard to know how much attention was paid to that booth at the convention. Uh, there were a number of complaints online about that. And there's certainly, uh, certainly at, at least some critics think that ISNA is selling out to Homeland, to Customs and Border Patrol protection uh, by having them there saying, hey, these are the people that have gone after uh, immigrants uh, why are you selling? Why are you having them here at our convention? Okay. Now, what was the the uh, party breakdown of the uh, of the politicians and public officials that attended the convention? Because that was one of the questions that was put into the Q and A just now. What do you? What do you? I mean, can you make a guess? Uh, most mostly Democrat. Okay. And but at the same time, one of the things that we have spoken about amongst ourselves is that an awful lot of their social uh, agenda would be essentially supported more by by the Democrats, uh, excuse me, by the conservatives or conservative Republicans. Is there some sort of dichotomy going on here uh, that essentially, on one hand, they they side with Democrats because it 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 helps them essentially achieve influence in American society, but at the same time, it may not necessarily align with their values. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, in fact. Uh... Senator Fadi Quadura made an interesting point, and he was bragging about actually getting. He's he's a Democrat, but he was bragging about getting crossover votes because they because Republicans resonated with his message, and uh, but he made a big point to say, and I, I think that this is probably a more widely held position than it is than is openly acknowledged. But he said it's really important that we basically, you know, as Muslims. Um, recognize that political parties are vehicles. Don't get, don't get caught up in being one party or the other. Okay, now you've worked on Capitol Hill and how would politicians base, what type of calculus would they actually start thinking about when it comes time to decide wh whether or not, or how to interact with an organization like ISNA? Well, I'm getting votes. <laughs> so you might want to show up at a conference to attract a specific voting block. Okay. Now, do you think that they're going to be able to recruit or is, is going to be able to recruit the next generation of supporters, uh, given some of the difficulties that, that, that you were able to document? What do you think, you know, what, what's the, the, uh, What's the, the 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 value that's being ventured by ISNA to its supporters? You know, what's its value proposition? Do you think? Uh, I think they're I think they're internally split right now, uh, and I think that what what we're seeing at the convention and the commentary online is that they don't have a clear a clear vision for the future, and I think if you don't have that clear vision, it's going to be hard to attract uh, the next generation. Now, I think some of ISNA's leadership is well aware that that's a problem. 
Uh, the president, Safa Zorzur, um, was pretty defensive about the voting membership of ISNA, which is apparently somewhere around 5,000. I think their uh, membership in general is private, but they they did leak that number. Um, but uh, while he was defensive and trying, I think kind of trying to say, hey, we're, we're not looking as bad as you say we're looking, uh, the vice president of the organization is actually stepping down from her position so that she can recruit. But I don't think if they don't have a clear message of what they're offering and what's the, hey, what's the goal for the future, they're going to have a lot of trouble recruiting, even if she's working really hard on it. Okay. Now, one of the things, was there any sort of ideological split, do you think, between the younger members and the older members uh, who attended? Uh, you know, what do you think's going on there? And what do you think that the younger attendees are looking for from an organization like ISNA? Um. You know, so a lot of the questions that were asked, they were asked uh, written down on pieces of paper. So it wasn't like you had individuals from the crowd standing up and asking their questions. So it's a little bit hard to tell, you know, younger versus older. But based off of dress, um, it was most of the women at this convention were wearing hijabs. Um, I did not wear a hijab or any kind of head covering, but there were a handful of women there who did not wear a hijab. So I didn't really stand out. Um, but pretty much all the young women wore hijabs. Um, they, I, I suppose some, some didn't, um, but the women who were wearing niqabs, there were a number of niqabs, and those were almost all young women. So I think that, I mean, it certainly seemed like it's the, the younger generation at this convention that is in, interested in more uh, Islamist leaning uh, vision for the future. And they want to know, I, I would assume they want to know how to rear their families. Okay. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in one of the articles was uh, you you heard one speaker essentially say that American evangelicals had essentially misinterpreted or or, or inaccurately conveyed how uh, the founding of the United States. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. I I just found that so very interesting. And and was there a certain surreal aspect to having to, to listen to that? Uh it was certainly surprising to hear that. Uh, so, I, yeah, sure, the speaker, um, and I apologize, I'll, I'll pull it up, um, his, his name. Um, it's in the article that I wrote. Um, but yeah, he said that, hey, uh, the Enlightenment wouldn't have happened without uh, Muslim influence. And then he, he also went on from there to say that uh, there was Islamist influence at the very founding of the U.S., and he said that hey, uh, the founders were influenced by Mohammedan Christians. So it's evangelicals who rewrote U.S. history when they, at the found, you know, from the founding. Um, so uh, fantastic. Uh, pie in the sky. <laughs> right. Now, one of the things, you know, I've attended a number of religious events over the course of my career, and generally there may not be reporters there all the time, Okay. But there is some sort of uh, coverage of it, and and the, and if they pass resolutions, and the thing is, it won't be just type like a preview, but they'll actually write about what happened at this convention afterwards. Uh, but at the same time, I haven't seen an awful lot of coverage. Is was FWI one of the only sources of information about this event, and, and you know after the fact? And, and, and what do you think is going, you know, aside from maybe Muslim publications here in the United right. States, and aside from that, what, what do you think, if there isn't any, or, or what explains the level of coverage that you've seen? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I certainly didn't see any other press there. Um, there was definitely press there beforehand because they did, you know, some preview stuff that, as you mentioned, um, some local Chicago um, coverage. And I, I did see like a couple articles I before and after, but uh, as you said, not not really widespread. I don't know. I don't know why um, there wouldn't be more. And it may may have to do with the internal split and perhaps not wanting to weigh too heavily into that that split that seems to be going on. Okay. Now, where do you think this story is headed? And, and it looks as if, it, from the impression that I get from the articles that we've published, uh, it seems as if this is an institution in decline, okay? Or is, you know, 
Is that a good thing or, or a bad thing from the people who are interested in counter Islamism? What do you think? Oh, interesting. Um, so I, I think perhaps I should just mention this a little bit of this split uh, a little more. So it seems that uh, in the past, Turkey's been a little bit more involved with ISNA. And in recent years, uh, one of their presidents, Sayed Said, was apparently kicked out for being basically uh, anti-Turkey. I may be oversimplifying this for the sake of discussion. But uh, there seemed to be a Turkish boycott going on uh, the ISTA convention this year. We certainly didn't see a prominent Turkish presence at the convention. Um, and CARE apparently boycotted. Uh, Zara Balu wrote about it on her Facebook. Um, and uh, the vice president of ISNA, she said, hey, this issue, this issue is taken care of, basically insinuating, hey, we're not anti-Turkey anymore. Um, but still, nonetheless, Turkey didn't really seem to be present at this convention. What's going on there? We're not exactly sure. But it seems like there is a split between, uh, you know, Muslim Brotherhood Turkey influence and the old guard ISNA in the U.S. And we're not sure where what that what that means for the future. Where does ISNA yeah. where does ISNA end up coming down? Okay. Now I'm going to change the subject a little bit, and I don't mean to ambush you, but you've written an awful lot about Oberlin College and Mahalati, and. Uh, I think last week, essentially, there was a congressional letter that was sent to Oberlin, largely as a consequence of your reporting. Can you talk a little bit about what 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 you that story? And, and I don't want to rehash it entirely, but and where do you think that story is headed? Oh, uh, well, we can talk about regime influence, foreign regime influence in the U.S. And is that a problem? Is foreign funding? Uh, a problem to schools. Is that well enough tracked? No. Um, I think it's fantastic that Congress is interested in this issue. Um, this is just one of many people in the U.S. that need to be looked into really for foreign regime influence. And what does that mean, not just for foreign regimes and uh, support going back and forth, but where, where do young people who are being taught by these professors, where do they end up? And I, I apologize for the audience. Um, the man that I wrote about was Maha, is Professor Mahalati at Oberlin College, in case we uh, miss, that, miss that name there. Okay, yeah, prof yeah. All right, now tell me, why is he a problem? Oh, why is he a problem? Um, well, yeah. he, he certainly appears to have a lot of Iranian regime ties uh, at present that he has not clearly disavowed. Um, he's also in the past, uh, in the 1980s massacre uh, in, in Iran, of, um, there, there was a terrible massacre, and there's thousands of political prisoners were executed by Iran. Iran got away with it. And uh, Mahalati was then UN ambassador for Iran, and uh, he pretty much for sure knew what was going on. Um, but regardless of whether he did or didn't, he then he then tried to cover up that it happened uh, when it became very public that it happened. Uh, try, tried to blame it on Iran's enemies, but he's never come clean about that. Uh, so it certainly looks like he was pretty directly involved. He's been criticized by the previous, I think the previous uh, Iranian ambassador um, to the UN uh, for, for not distancing himself further. Uh, so he's never come clean about that. So there's the, there's the massacre that happened in the past. To what degree was he involved in that? And then in the present, uh, possible regime relationship right now. And, and the man lives in the U.S. and teaches in the U.S. at a U.S. college. Right. Now, is there a sense that, that and I, I, has anyone at Oakland decided to essentially, like, uh, accelerate the the, uh, the campaign against him, or are they basically just at this point uh, just kind of waiting to see the congressional letter play itself out? You mean Oberlin leadership? Yes. Yeah. I haven't. I have not seen a response from Oberlin leadership. So unless they just came out with one, um, my guess is that they're they're probably trying to stall for time. Okay, I just find that astonishing that they haven't responded publicly to that letter. Is that am I am I just being naive? Yeah, you worked on Capitol Hill. You, I mean, how do people respond to those letters when they get them? Usually, I don't want to be cynical, but um, 
I, I think that it's it would it's not surprising. It's not surprising at all. Okay. All right. So is there anything else that we think that you need to cover or, or inform people about the ISNA conference? And where do you think that organization is headed in the future, I guess? And what choices does it have to make? Sure. Uh, well, for one thing, um, I'm guessing, I'm betting that some of the people who are listening have already read our articles on FWI. But if you haven't, we've got several. Um, Anuf did a piece on Hindu, anti-Hindu hate being imported at the conference. Um, Martha Lee did a piece this, re this week that's really good on the internal divisions. That'll give you some more background there. And Sam Westrup uh, did a piece on, uh, on the, really on the Turkish, the Turkish background there. So um, it, it certainly looks like they are in decline based off the message at the convention. They didn't have uh, they didn't have a clear vision. They don't have a clear vision for the future. So unless they get that cleaned up, then I, I would, I would imagine they'll continue to dwindle. Okay. Now, and I guess, how do you think that the Islamist community here in the U.S. would respond to that? What, what do you do? You think they'll be happy or sad with its disappearance? Or I mean, and not that it's going to disappear, but suppose you know its continued decline to the point where it becomes you know, essentially like a, a, a dormant or less effective institution? Well, I think the biggest thing is that they're at a crossroads right now. And at least some of ISNA's leadership understands that. Um, and the question is, can they recover? Uh, they might, they might recover. Um, I wouldn't, I would not count that out as an option. Um, the other thing is there are a lot of other Islamist groups. So, and people move around. So mm -hmm. I it just, I think it just makes things more complicated. I mean, is there I would any yeah. No, no, go ahead. Is there any possibility that, and uh, the, the, you know, this is be being maybe naive, but that at some point the institution or ISNA could become a force for reform or an updating of how Islam is practiced in in the United States? Sure. Some people probably want that, but um, we'll see. Okay. That's that's Did nice you... and hopeful. All right. Did you, you didn't did you see any evidence of that? And there, was there anybody that expressed that from the floor, from the questions, or were they just looking to essentially sustain their sense of order and nomos? Um, it and, really seemed. Yeah. It really seemed like, based off the questions, people were interested in more hardline answers and frustrated that they weren't getting hardline answers. Right. So it didn't so, seem like, and there and combating that, there wasn't much of. There wasn't any kind of reformist message. It was just a non-message. Okay. Now, now suppose, you know, what would recovery look like for ISNA? And what would your recommendations be? And, and you know, as a non-Muslim, uh, you know, what would your recommendations be for reform for the organization or revitalization? Sure. Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, well, I, they they've got to have clearer messaging on what they mean. Uh, from from the ground up on their moral messaging, their social issues messaging, they've, they've got to figure out what in the world they believe on things. Uh, and then their politics is going to be downstream for that, from that. Uh, right. And I, I think that a lot of you were asking earlier, you know, why, why were people there? Uh, what did they want? Um, I, I think they want to know how to live their lives. Uh, and they're, it was just, it was very vague. So they, they, yeah. need, they would need to clean that up. Yeah. Now you spoke a little bit about the leadership being divided. Can you elaborate on that? And what do you think of the, the prospects that they would actually like try to like maybe even abandon or disavow their Islamist roots? Isn't as, it's, it's Islamist roots and say, yes, this is part of our past. Do you think that, it, is there anybody in the leadership that might be interested in doing that? I don't know. Okay. I, mean, yeah, I think that, I think that's I think that's a great question. Um, that's I mean I, that's really what we'd like to see. Um, yeah, because I've been thinking a lot about what would reform look like from these organizations, and one of uh -huh. the things is I would sure like to see, you know, you know them to stop offering re references to Hassan Al Banna on their websites in a laudatory manner, because you right, would think right. that, you know that would be wonderful. And also essentially say, yeah, we had our, our roots in the Muslim Brotherhood, but we're here in the United States. And we're not interested in promoting that type of agenda anymore. And we're looking to help people practice Islam as a uh, as a private faith, just the same way that the other faiths are. And 
yeah, we want to play a role in politics, but we're not looking to dominate the, the way things are. So I and, you know, let, let me just yeah. clarify. I, I don't think I don't see that right now from ISNA. Um, and if you they're uh, actually holding an event this evening, um, celebrating Car Dolly. So it, I, that's not that's not reform right there. So you could, yeah. you know, you could start, you know, coming out and saying, hey, you know, these Islamists that we've looked to in the past, we've realized they were wrong. Uh, we're headed in a new direction. This is what the new direction looks like. Uh, that's not that does not seem to be happening. Yeah. So how worried it seems like you you mentioned that there was a lot of young people at this event. Mm -hmm. How worried should we be that younger generations seem to be leaning towards Islamism here in the U.S.? Uh, it's a concern. Uh, I don't, it, we shouldn't be worried about anything, but taking it seriously, yes. Okay. All right. I think that is actually, uh, that's more of a, a C.S. Lewis worldview, I think, that you're offering us right now, isn't it? So uh, um, I think, I just want to thank Susanna. I think that's pretty much the end of the questions. Uh, we've come to the end of our webinar, and I want to thank you again, Susanna. And I want people to be on the lookout for next week's webinar offerings, which will be emailed to you over the weekend. Uh, just briefly, uh, 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 Cliff Perry will be speaking on Wednesday, uh, excuse me, uh, Ashley Perry will be speaking on Wednesday, a part of uh, Middle East Forum's Insider, Israel Insider series. And then next Friday, Cliff Smith, director of our Washington project, will be speaking with Mindy Belts. Uh, former senior editor of World Magazine about the Kurdish fight for rights in the Middle East and how it relates to American values and interests in the region. And with that, I want to thank everyone for attending and wish everyone a good weekend. Thanks so much.